Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations that you picked up when you came in. And uh, if you could give us any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics and future speakers, the CME committee is always interested in those ideas. Uh, today I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. Greg Barclay. Dr. Barclay is uh, board certified in both psychiatry and adolescent psychiatry. Uh, currently, he is a president and medical director of Barclay & Associates, and he also is uh, an adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at uh, Des Moines University, and he has kindly uh, accepted our invitation uh, today to discuss marijuana use and psychiatric disorders in adolescents. Uh, jo uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Barclay. Thank you, Stephen. Can you all hear me okay? I'm not used to using this thing. Not I'll end up using the uh, micro. Can you hear me now? Okay. Well, I do appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you about um, adolescent um, marijuana use and psychiatric disorders. Um, it's a very hot and emerging topic in adolescent psychiatry, um, given all the changes that are taking place um, nationally in terms of medical marijuana and legalization of marijuana. Something that isn't known um, as widely, though, is marijuana's association with psychiatric disorders. So I'd like to take a little time to review that with you today. Um, we have some information which I think will be very useful to you and your work with patients, um, especially those of you who work with adolescent uh, patients. Um, initially, um, questions that come to mind that I'm hoping to answer today um, include um, how we can better understand adolescent marijuana use, um, who is using and why they're using, what the relationship is uh, between psychiatric disorders and marijuana use in adolescents, and um, why we should be more concerned now than in the past. Well, as all of you know, adolescence is a time of transition. Um, adolescents are not children anymore. Of course, they aren't adults anymore either. Um, everybody knows that adolescence is a time of great change. Um, these kids are growing up in more ways than one. They're uh, not only undergoing a lot of physical and cognitive changes, emotional, social, and behavioral changes occur as well. Something less widely known and um, more known in the, just the last 25 years has been the growth and development of their brain during adolescence, starting in puberty, um, and the brain not fully mature um, until age 24 or 25. Um, and therefore, because there's a great deal of change going on in the brains of these kids, even the most well-adjusted or seemingly well-adjusted children and teenagers can develop, become very sick or become very disabled and um, fall under the influence of marijuana and other drugs as well. That does not help. So, um, as you see, many of them, in spite of um, what they want to believe, are still children. Many of them, many adolescents, um, think they're adults and know more than adults, but aren't. What are adolescents really looking for? Um, they're wanting trusting relationships with peers. It's all part of normal development, a sense of identity, the path in the world and independence from parents, which is exactly, of course, what their parents want, too. They may not agree on how to do that or when to do it, but it is generally a shared um, belief, and it's something that we as healthcare providers want for them as well. Now, with that, though, comes the fact that trusting relationships with peers means that um, they're going to be involved with peers their parents may not approve of, which is also part of normal development. Some may be positive and some may be negative. Um, and they'll do almost anything to be accepted by their peers. Therefore, peer pressure is really, does really indeed exist. Um, they're also looking for a chance to figure out who they are. And this is where they will fall into conflict oftentimes with their parents in terms of challenging their parents' values and beliefs regarding anything, religion, drugs, um, alcohol, moral, moral, moral standards, and so forth. 
They're also looking for their place where they want to go in the world, who they want to become. Again, a very normal developmental milestone for teenagers. But because they aren't experienced and they're very immature still, they tend to make decisions based on what's right in front of them and not looking down the road. Another um, source of, con of interminable conflict, it seems, between adolescents and their parents, at least judging from the ones who end up in my office with their parents. And as we all know, adolescence no longer stops at the age of 18. Many college students and beyond are still dealing with many adolescent issues, especially this figuring out who they are and where they want to go. And independence from parents, of course, is another major issue. Again, I'd probably be out of business if this could ever be resolved effectively, um, but it leads to a lot of angst between parents and their teenagers and acting out um, that ends, lands them in a mental health therapist's office. So how does this all relate to drugs? Because adolescents are susceptible to peer influence and they're busy trying to find themselves and they're challenging their parents' authority, experimentation with drugs is inevitable. And um, it's like 75, 80% of all teenagers have had some exposure to um, drugs and alcohol in our culture, experimentation is considered to be within the range of normal adolescent behavior. Um, most of them um, have at least tried, but not all of them are going to end up abusing or becoming dependent on um, marijuana. In a um, recent study that was done in 2006, it was uh, uh, um, established um, something that many of us who are mental health professionals already know, the parents are not usually aware of much going on with their kids in terms of their drug use. These kids are very good, as adolescents normally are, at leading a double life. The side that they present to their friends is very different from the side that they present when they come home for dinner and have dinner with their parents. So only 50% of the parents were aware of any drug use. Um, and of the kids who were really using quite heavily, only 25% of the parents were aware of the extent of the use. I always like this cartoon. I keep this one at my office and show this to parents. Um, those of you who read Zitz, it's uh, New Year's Eve. Jeremy and his girlfriend are there with his Jeremy's parents uh, having a little, little peck. Mother says, oh dear, isn't that nice? First kiss. Meanwhile, look what's going on out on the porch. <laughs> No, this is part of, this is very natural for all parents. We have all, all, any one of us who've raised children and teenagers know that we tend to underestimate um, what they're doing in the other part of their life that we don't know about. There's an organization called Monitoring the Future, which has been surveying students um, in high school since 1975. That's their website. They've got a lot of good information published. Um, the lo most latest uh, survey they did in 2012 included 50,000 high school students from all over the country. And this is kind of what the um, data from that study showed us. Um, alcohol use among 12th graders, 73% have tried it, 45% have been drinking in the last 30 days, 30% have been drunk in the last 30 days, 27% had at least five drinks in a row in at least two weeks, and 3% drink daily. So keep focused on the bottom lines there in the next few slides in terms of the daily use. What about nicotine? 47% tried, 22% smoked in the last 30 days, and 12% smoke on a daily basis. Nicotine's a highly addictive drug. Marijuana, 45% have tried it, 23% have used in the last 30 days, and 5% use on a daily basis. Other substances. 27% used an illicit substance other than marijuana. And then we go down the list, narcotics, amphetamines, cocaine, Oxycontin. And then this is um, with eighth graders at the very bottom. Um, inhalants tend to be uh, much more widely used among them, probably because of availability. 16% um, said that they'd actually used inhalants. Looking at it another way, if we look at these data, you see this bar graph here. On the left side, the alcohol lifetime use. Um, so any teenager who's used um, alcohol at least once um, would be represented there. So it's 73 or so percent. And then we see the percentages for cigarettes, marijuana, and illicit substances. And you'll see how this changes when you go down 
um, from lifetime to 30 days. Um, and then if we look at daily use, see what happens. Alcohol drops and marijuana goes up. So more teenagers are smoking marijuana on a daily basis in this country than using alcohol on a daily basis. Of course, um, nicotine still leads the way on daily um, use. The reason that nicotine is important is it's considered, as, as many of you know, a gateway drug, if you will, um, in terms of leading to other drug use um, after uh, they start, they initiate the use of nicotine. Okay, so why are they using? Um, it doesn't just occur at random. Teenagers have their reasons for entering the drug culture. Uh, their parents tend to believe that it's the negative influence of their peers and tend to blame their peers. Sometimes that's the case, but a lot of cases, uh, teenagers change their peers to meet their needs, and those needs tend to be within the drug culture. The drug culture exists in every town and city in this country. Um, and it can be defined as, as the culture that permits and, and accepts and encourages illicit drug use. And what does it offer these teenagers? Well, a lot of things they're looking for, acceptance, unconditional acceptance, um, lack of rejection, um, and low expectations. You just have to show up. And so in many um, schools, there's the divisions among the preps and the stoners and uh, jocks. There's lots of different groups. But after hours and within the context of the drug culture, we see these kids come together and use together. So it meets a lot of their psychological needs. In addition, there's other factors that um, affect um, and lead to teen um, drug use and marijuana use being a major gateway drug. Genetics play some role, we don't know really how much. Personality traits such as novelty seeking, risk taking traits, aggressive tendencies, and history of psychiatric problems like attention deficit disorder, um, conduct disorder, um, depression, anxiety, they play a role. Outside factors, um, lack of parental monitoring, parental active use of drugs and alcohol, um, affiliation with a deviant peer group that uses, and then certain major crises occur during adolescence and can occur um, in, on past um, adolescence as well that will trigger dr adult um, drug use or relapse. Um, failure being one, um, certainly um, violence, exposure, um, trauma, rejection, um, harassment. These are all issues that affect teenagers and could certainly draw them into the arms of the drug culture and most kids become members of the drug culture long before they actually start using it. Why is marijuana important? Why should we be studying this now and talking about this now? Well, it's easily available. It grows locally. Um, Ditchweed, um, other, other na mainstream can uh, can uh, marijuana grows locally. It's legalized in two states, and I think it's been medical use now in 13 or more states. It's being hotly debated in many states now in terms of legalization. Um, kids perceive it as natural and therefore they assume it's harmless, yet it's a much more potent drug today than it was 30, 40 years ago. And because of that, there's significant problems associated with it. Now this graph can be kind of a bit overwhelming, but if you, it, what this shows is how the potency of THC, which is the active ingredient of marijuana, has increased over the years. You start here with 1975. This down here is ditchweed in the yellow. The green is, the, um, is marijuana, garden variety marijuana. That's meant as a pun. And then in the orange is the more synthetically um, grown marijuana, specifically grown inside and in laboratories to be much more potent. In England, it would call, it'd be called cinsamella. Um, the street term would be skunk. But you can see how the potency has increased from 1975 to 2006. It goes on beyond that, off that chart into 2009, the blue line representing the mean potency among all three groups. Um, and if we just exclude the, um, or the cincinella and we just look at um, everyday marijuana, the potency has increased. Down here, it's about 1.5% THC. Up there, that um, second line is about is the 6% mark. So it's approaching 6%. Um, 
That's very, very important information to know because it's a, psych, a psychomimetic drug. Um, so the potency is going to result in more um, potential problems. It's been used, of course, a long time. Its use dates back to China in, the, um, in uh, 3000 BC or so, used for the same reasons it's used now, to elevate mood, um, nausea, pain control. Um, but of course, the version available back then, the strain available was much less potent than what is available now. These are some examples of how it's processed and, and um, smoked. Um, this is the most illicit, widely used illicit drug in the world, um, and certainly quite heavily used among teens in this country. Data also show that the use is increasing very significantly and in younger and younger teenagers. That's important because data and studies that have been done and have been replicated show that the early onset of drug use and, and marijuana use in teenagers um, leads to significant difficulties farther down the road in terms of graduation to hard drugs and academic failure and, as we're going to see, psychiatric problems as well. So just by way of review, let's talk a little bit about what marijuana does. The acute effects, um, you, it's, it's smoked, and so it's a very immediate onset of action. There's receptors. The cannabinoid receptors in the brain are very active and pick this up right away, which is why you have a very rapid increase in heart rate. The eyes turn red. Um, there can be the, there's the high feeling. Um, and sensations are suddenly enhanced and increased, dry mouth, and of course, hunger increases. Um, that's part of what of the medical uses of marijuana are, is to increase hunger in anorexic um, individuals with chronic illness. But cognitive effects occur as well. Many of the students uh, who smoke marijuana are unaware of this. Um, it creates almost like a matrix effect. Remember the movie Matrix? How uh, people living in the matrix weren't ever aware that they were in the matrix. And many kids who use uh, marijuana kind of get into that matrix. They do not see every, what everybody else sees in terms of what happens to them. Um, so they may feel like their memory works better, but actually, objectively, they have significant impairment in memory. Time, uh, the passage of time is distorted. It moves faster. That's because of the effect it has on the cerebellum, which controls time management and time passage uh, perception. Um, Difficulty shifting attention, impaired balance and coordination, um, deficits, measured deficits in verbal learning. So the students who go and have a joint before school typically aren't going to learn much in school that day. If they, well, they won't remember what they learn. Um, but um, also, marijuana can exert um, a very different effect. It can cause increased anxiety, fear, distress, psychosis in some cases. Um, after just smoking one, um, you know, one blunt. That's because the receptor for uh, the CB1 receptor in the brain, which is the main receptor for cannabinoids, is located in its, on, a, on the neuron in such a way that it can have a bidirectional kind of effect in terms of being more in, in modulating inhibition or, or activation of the neurons. These um, Students who use um, marijuana, these teenagers will have a 6 to 11 percent in, um, uh, fatal active, um, accident victims will test positive for it, and they'll have impaired driving performance. They do not, if you sit and you talk with teenagers who are using, they, they say they'll, they'll smoke instead of drink because they are in control. Well, they, it's a perception of being in control. They actually aren't. Um, they actually have very poor driving performance. Obviously worse if you combine it with alcohol. Here's a youngster ready to get in the car and take off. Let's hope he hasn't been smoking. If he was your son, you certainly would, <laughs> would want that. Um, OK, what other things happen? There's a high risk of sexual activity, so um, unwanted pregnancy can occur. There's, of course, illegal activities because of the loss of inhibition um, that goes with the uh, um, use of marijuana on an acute basis and use of other substances. Now, as this goes on and these teenagers become more regular users of marijuana. Um, there could be a, an addiction pattern developed. That's another um, myth on the street among um, adolescent, um, adolescents who use is that it's not addictive. It is addictive, highly so. 
Um, there has been observed and measured withdrawal effects and tolerance effects. Um, and um, um, it also tends to be used in spite of the negative consequences, similar to alcohol and other addictive substances. But the cognitive effects are what concern, um, are increasingly concerning because um, there can be cognitive problems measured um, on objective testing even um, when um, um, these teenagers have stopped using. Now with adults who are using, um, if they're abstinent for a month, they're usually the neuropsychological testing will re revert back to baseline, but there's some evidence that that does not work with adolescents, that adolescents have continued impairment in executive functioning if they've had heavy use of marijuana. Um, one of the more profound um, changes that um, most of you who work with teenagers have seen um, is this amotivational syndrome, the, you know, sitting in the basement playing video games at age 25, you know, kind of syndrome that develops as a result of uh, chronic use and a chronically impaired attention span. It's because of marijuana's effects in very certain critical areas of the brain. Um, and then, of course, chronic use leads to lots of problems, health problems, academics, family conflict, um, psychiatric disorders, graduation to other drugs, and some emerging evidence in terms of its effect, um, its exact um, brain damage. Fiction that's out there. Um, this, is, this is something that kids will say to me, say, well, it's natural, it can't hurt me. And I show them this slide. I have this, keep this one on my computer, along with the, the information from the National, information, National Institute of Drug Abuse to show them what, what the brain does when you take a smoke a joint and how it lights up in certain areas. But these are natural, too, and we wouldn't eat these, these poisonous mushrooms or pick up that frog or deal with that rattlesnake or go um, jump in the poison ivy. Here's another fiction. It's medicine. Well, of course, warfarin, for example, highly used for therapeutic purposes, but yet the same drug in higher doses is, is lethal. Um, this is what kids believe. Um, their adolescents don't think the way adults do in terms of recognizing the differences between this. They see it as all or nothing. So, you know, it's medicine. It's got to be good for me. Yeah, well, nope. The dangers of these messages are, can be shown here on this graph. This is, again, from the um, uh, Monitoring the Future group that, that has been studying these adolescents since 1975. If you look at, at this, you see the, the, how use of marijuana um, in the red, or I'm sorry, in the blue, it relates to how, how adolescents perceive its level of risk. So back in the 70s, um, use was high. That was you know, coming out of the flower generation era when there was a lot of marijuana use and the risk was perceived to be relatively low because it wasn't as risky as it is now because it wasn't as potent. Then there was this time in the 1990s at the middle of the graph where um, perception of risk went way up. That was probably as a result of DARE and some other um, very intentional efforts to uh, do more drug awareness in the schools. And so use went down. Now as we approach and get into 2010, you can see um, risk is going, perception held steady for a while, but now it's going down, at, whereas use is going up. That's I'm almost certain that that's related to the legalization movements and the medical use um, movement taking place that's confusing kids and leading them, and, and I think their parents, to question whether this is a toxic um, drug or a beneficial drug. So on to some neurobiology. Why, is, why are adolescents at particular risk? Well, the human brain... Um, starts off one way in childhood and ends up another way in adulthood. And then in teenage years, it's, I tell people it's like you buy a house and you totally gut the inside and you start rebuilding the inside. So the exterior looks the same, but the interior is totally different. This is a very dynamic process going on in the human brain at that point. There's um, a lot of pruning going on, so pruning of the white matter, um, and building of new connections and synapses so that complex reasoning skills, ability to retain lots of information um, and apply it, working memory, all those skills 
have to be developed during adolescence. So there's all this rewiring going on and connections taking place in their brains. Um, and marijuana affects those particular brain regions um, and um, with sometimes very negative uh, consequences. This is a good way to look at this, what I just told you. On the left side, representing you know, the field when you, before you build your house, um, and then building the house, and then the built house. Um, if you have a tornado blow in, which is the structure that's most likely to be affected, um, and uh, obviously the middle one. And that, that's representative of what's going on in the teenage brain relative to the adult brain on, on the right. And the studies that have been done with adult psychopathology and executive functioning in adults when they use THC versus when they aren't using, and, and you compare that against teenagers, there's very clear differences. It would certainly suggest that there is a toxic effect that takes place with um, uh, marijuana use in um, the brains of adolescents. There's also now data which show that um, there's a diminished whole brain volume in, in um, teenagers um, who have are, use marijuana on a regular basis um, with increased um, white matter and decreased gray matter. Does anybody here know what psychiatric illness um, is manifested by increased white matter and decreased gray matter? It's schizophrenia. Um, schizophrenia has many deficits in, the, in that area, those areas of the brain. The connections between the brain, it's manifested um, by heightened perceptions, mis misjudging perceptions, and disordered thinking patterns, as well as significant changes in affect and mood, all of which one tends to see with chronic marijuana users. There's also studies that have been done um, with animal studies um, where um, um, animals that are pu pubertal um, versus animals that are not are injected with THC and then their brains, their, especially their hippocampus um, and their cerebellum are studied and there's evidence that that THC was neurotoxic to them. It actually caused diminishing size of those structures in the brain compared to adult rats. Um, and also it uh, inhibited its synapse formation and neuron survival. So you have cell death going on um, more rapidly um, with THC in critically, um, in, in, in brains undergoing critical development. It also can affect the glutamine and the dopamine transmitter systems. These are maturing systems in the brain that um, are um, peaking during puberty um, and early adolescence. Glutamine and dopamine are also critical um, in schizophrenic disorders and um, in uh, mood disorders, especially with schizophrenic disorders, there's some change in the dopamine sensitivities of the brain. Glucose metabolism is also affected in areas that um, are not, that are also um, oftentimes um, affected in um, other psychiatric disorders as well, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So the question that has to be asked, we don't know for sure the answer, is does the THC use at this time in development um, prime the brain for later subsequent mental illness. Well, what about mental disorders in uh, marijuana use? There's always been this chicken or the egg theory, you know, as to which one leads to which. Um, in point of fact, with all psychiatric disorders, there, it, it, be that in adults um, and um, teenagers, comorbidity is the rule. There's a lot of co coexisting drug use marijuana use with various psychiatric disorders. So it's very difficult to tease all that out in terms of the chicken or the egg. But this is what is known. Look at depression here. Um, many individuals with depression, many teenagers will tell me that they smoke because it helps them feel better, but actually objectively, if you use objective measures, they don't, their depression tends to worsen. Um, um, and there's evidence now that, that supports more causation um, especially in girls. Girls, of course, are at higher risk for depression anyway in adolescence. In child and adolescent psychiatry, it's the little, you have lots of little boys up to the time, and not as many girls until about the age of 10 or 11, and then it flips. Um, then you have a lot of girls who are depressed, and so they're higher risk for, for depression anyway 
Um, but in um, studies that have been done, weekly use of marijuana led to doubled the risk for de subsequent depression in girls. Daily use f made it four times so. Um, anxiety disorders. Many individuals with anxiety disorders will say they smoke because it helps them with their anxiety. Perhaps, but because of the effect of THC in the brain and um, on synapses and the bidirectional influence on, in the um, neurons, um, it can intensify anxiety disorder as well. And sure enough, in some studies, the increasing studies, it's been shown to be associated with the earlier onset of panic attacks um, and increased risk of various anxiety disorders. Um, social anxiety disorder tends to be a particularly um, strong predictor to marijuana use. There's a lot of comorbidity with uh, marijuana use and social anxiety disorder for obvious reasons. People who are afraid to be around people, they, they find that the marijuana relaxes them. Um, and so there's a lot of self-medication going on there. In post-traumatic stress disorder, very high levels of comorbidity as well. Um, unfortunately, study, objective studies show that the PTSD symptoms worsen um, oftentimes um, with marijuana use. Um, and this is a, a refrain that's seen over and over again with these psychiatric disorders, is that uh, the marijuana does seem to catalyze their progression. Um, what about in suicide? Um, there have been some studies that have looked at the association with marijuana use and say, suicidal behavior. Um, one particular one of concern um, established the link between 14 and 15 year olds committing suicide with their marijuana use. And, and they didn't find that in adults. Bipolar disorder, a hot diagnosis these days. Um, lots of increased prevalence of bipolar disorder, probably due to, to um, um, diagnostic criteria changes um, and uh, marketing by, by the, comp the, drug, the pharmaceutical companies that are interested in establishing that diagnosis to use the drugs. But, um, Cannabis tends to precede the use of mania. There tends to be a, a much stronger association with mania than there is with depression. Um, uh, probably because of the way the cannabis affects the dopamine system of the brain. Dopamine tied to mania and um, psychosis. Um, the cannabis um, use in individuals who've already been diagnosed tends to um, have much higher rates of mania. Anyone who's treated manic patients know that each episode, it's harder and harder to get them into remission. So the individuals who are using substances, marijuana in particular, who have manic depressive illness are at very high risk and their, their, their prognosis is very poor when they continue to use marijuana. Um, with teenagers, of course, big concern is that the cannabis use often precedes the onset. And so in the teenagers with manic psychosis, at very high rates compared to controls of prior use of marijuana. Um, conduct disorder, there's a bi-directional relationship. Um, the same issues that affect conduct disordered youth psychosocially and internally in terms of their trouble with regulation and their novelty seeking and impulsivity problems um, also put, make them at higher risk for substance use. However, there was a fairly, well, not recent study, it was um, 2003, that showed um, relatively conclusively that the marijuana use seems to predict conduct disorder even when controlling for the other variables, suggesting, again, the effects the marijuana has in the brain, the areas of the brain that control executive function, memory, and emotional control may have some effect on the emergence of the conduct disorder. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Well, the symptoms of ADHD, especially inattentive type, are very much um, overlap with chronic use of marijuana and with some of the acute symptoms of marijuana use as well. Um, there is a high level of comorbidity here. Um, the thing that I'm most suspicious of are the teenagers coming to my office declaring that they now have ADD or they've self-diagnosed it, but they've never had it before. And there's no history of them showing any evidence of that disorder in childhood. Um, and they, their parents don't, um, don't report that either. Um, it really would raise the question, given that a large percentage of them have experimented with or are using marijuana on a regular basis, 
um, you know, probably better drug test them first. They don't like it when I request that and explain that to them, but if you have explained it carefully to them and, and, and ex show them the data and, the re and explain the reasons why, then if they don't get drug testing done and they come back and see you again in a month, then they've saved face at least and you can reassess them at that point and then test them. Marijuana leads to other drug use. Um, their, uh, uh, marijuana use at the age of 17 led to, uh, from 2.1 to 5.2 times the higher incidence of other drug use. Um, and early use tends to be the biggest predictor to going down the road to hard drug use. And then there's the reverse gateway um, theory as well. Nicotine's much more uh, addictive than marijuana. Marijuana use oftentimes leads to uh, nicotine dependency. Now, I want to spend a little time on the relationship between marijuana and schizophrenia. Um, there was a really significant study done in 1987 with 50,000 um, Swedish conscripts um, and, um, who had developed schizophrenia, and their, their rates of schizophrenia were 2.4 times more likely um, if they had a history of marijuana use during adolescence. Um, although initially it was refuted, this has been um, replicated in numerous studies. Um, now, here's a few of them here. Um, and there's continued evidence that um, schizophrenia, um, it, the development of schizophrenia seems to be significantly influenced by the use of marijuana in adolescence. Um, for example, Adolescents who were given um, synthetic marijuana, um, who, uh, compared to those who used plain marijuana, had a seven times um, um, increased rate of, um, of uh, psychotic episodes. Um, negative and positive um, psychotic symptoms also were increased with intravenous THC. It's all a matter of the potency of the drug, um, the onset of use, the regularity of use, and the frequency of the use. So given that marijuana may account for about 10% of schizophrenic disorders worldwide, raises the question of um, where we should stand with regard to the legalization of marijuana. This is information which isn't actively out there. This book, by the way, this is the uh, updated copy of the book, which is the 2012 edition. If anybody wants to look at it, I brought it along. Got a lot of information in there about the, um, how marijuana affects the human brain. Implications for treatment. Well, it's a tough situation because their use is, is increasing. Their adolescents have exposure to it at an earlier age. And as I said, it crosses all socioeconomic you know, boundaries. Um, parents aren't oftentimes aware they're using it. Um, medical marijuana is a big issue out there. It sends a message that it's beneficial. That's probably not the right message for us to be sending kids. Um, the potency is increasing significantly, and it will continue to increase significantly as marijuana is grown synthetically um, with some rates of THC uh, um, approaching 20%. We know that marijuana is comorbid with lots of psychiatric illness. Um, so what do we do about this? Where, how do we go about um, um, targeting uh, teenagers who need treatment? There are really two groups, in my view, who that really um, we should be looking at as practitioners. Um, the data show that heavy early users are at the highest risk. Of course, their brain is the most vulnerable at that point, so it would not be surprising that the early use is um, put, makes them much more um, um, at risk. So the, the kids who are heavily using at an early age, as well as the kids who already have psychiatric disorders, because the data show that those psychiatric disorders are worsened by um, the marijuana use. The idea of telling kids it's illegal and should be prohibited clearly has not helped. It's not been beneficial. Um, so um, once kids uh, become dependent on marijuana, um, the long-term prognosis for them is not good because they don't benefit from the standard treatments for marijuana dependency. Um, alcoholism is much better treated than marijuana addiction. 
so the best approach seems to be to start early with lots of education this information about the relationship between marijuana use and psychiatric disorders needs to be out there um, right alongside the beneficial use of marijuana and there are some clearly defined established benefits of marijuana um, um, it's just how does one separate these so that teenagers do not have a distorted perspective um, we have to have credibility as healthcare providers um, judging them is not helpful um, the ki these kids are are quite adept at seeing you as a parent and picking and, and and behaving like a parent they're gonna they so you have to really build a relationship with them um, working with these kids requires a lot of motivational interviewing skills in terms of meeting them where they're at and not being judgmental and not being the typical doctor authoritative you know you do it my way you know I, this is what has to be done approach because that doesn't work with with these teenagers uh, they have to be brought around um, to the notion that there really is something they need to be listening to and paying attention to those of you interested in prevention resources the NIDA website is given to you here lots of pamphlets that you can keep in your office distribute to parents and kids so in summary these this is a difficult group of teenagers um, they're very high risk um, they're not necessarily going to respond to traditional medical interventions um, they're uh, they tend to be nearsighted and so they oftentimes don't consider the possibility just like with other um, just like with cigarettes and various other substances the consequences on their health but certainly those who are already presenting with psychiatric disorders and psychiatric problems are coming to your office saying they need medicine for ADD or depressed and want to take an antidepressant um, this is that's the entree into t looking at their marijuana use um, and working with them on discontinuing their use or um, and showing them the data that show the clear relationship between um, marijuana use and um, mental disorders so that's pretty much the summary um, any questions at this point I will break the ice all right so Greg the uh, and this is kind of tongue-in-cheek but it's a if I understood you correctly adolescence is a time for novelty sinking for experimentation for risk-taking um, do you have any safe options for people to for adolescents to do that I mean you know it's like uh, they want to take a risk okay do we want to take a risk in the car do we want to take a risk uh, with sex do we want to take a risk with drugs are there any safe options that uh, we could formulate as a society to go out and take a risk I'm sorry it's just kind of a question I mean it's a fact they're gonna be winding up doing things of this sort or another and uh, yeah but 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 most of them turn out I mean they turn out okay you know we all I mean it's part of it's part of growing up and um, risks and mistakes occur and, and we learn from them um, you know the, the, taking risks will result in certain consequences and um, I think experimentation is, is part of that and I think as parents it's a, it's a matter of, of approaching um, adolescence and, 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 and saying you know I, we, you kind of bring it up early with them and say that drugs are out there and alcohol is out there Ex assume that you're gonna have some experimentation with it yeah you know and, and, and it, not way. necessarily condone it yeah uh, but it, except that experimentation is one thing. I think drawing the line between experimentation and use for, right. you know, abuse Addiction, and right. dependency is, right. is important. Okay, and then the other thing, it just seems counterintuitive to me that you have a drug with causes, withdrawal, no motivation, losing time, don't give a damn, and it worsens PTSD. I mean it's just bizarre I mean you, you your PTSD is you're so locked into the current moment and everything sets ever the brain on fire and you're wild and crazy about fearful of everything and you say that marijuana actually makes that worse it can it can because 
of, uh, in the same way that people who take, many people who take marijuana will, will say, I had this horrible panic attack when I smoked it. I had no one else around me who smoked it ever had a panic attack. So, so they can have an a idiosyncratic response. And PTSD, when, there's, when their brain is already so hyper aroused and they're already reset their, their uh, uh, neuro, neurobiology, if you will, um, certainly the marijuana can make that worse. But there is a lot of, of comorbidity with it. Many, many people with PTSD would say it, they, they, it derives, it helps them. But they don't necessarily see objectively what, how, what their deficits are. Yes. Yeah, Greg, there is a, a social parallel with uh, alcohol uh, prohibition that it was essentially predicated on uh, reducing the uh, deficits from alcohol. And during prohibition, there was a significant reduction in cirrhosis, deaths from cirrhosis in the country. But it was overturned because of other social costs. Do you think that's going to happen with uh, marijuana? As to whether marijuana is going to be legalized, yes, because because uh, I th I think that it's moving in that direction. I I can't tell you for sure. Um, there appears to be um, a, a increasing sort of groundswell um, of support for its use. You know, for 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 legally using. I think it's it's led by the medical marijuana movement. But I don't know for sure. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Is there any really hard data to show the difference in the facts that are coming out uh, on the two uh, states that have uh, legalized? I know it's pretty early yet, but is there any any anything to show that there's no difference, or it's a worse, or anything like that? I think it's a great subject for a study. I don't know, and probably somebody will do it, but I think it's a little early to tell because of the, um, you could probably get prevalence information at, at this point, but in terms of the relationship between subsequent um, psychiatric illness, probably it would be too early. It's a great idea, though. Could you spell out a little bit more the variables contributing to the increased potency of marijuana over the last 40 years? Is it just the synthetic marijuana, or is it? No, it's not the synthetic. If you uh, there's that uh, that study that that graph that I had here someplace. I, I won't. But you know that graph I showed you. Um, it, it the the THC concentration of um, regular garden variety marijuana has increased um, from the, about the 1.5 percent to to the um, almost the six percent level over that 30 years. It's probably a result of cultivation. Um, more, and more, you know, selective breeding of it. I, I think there's there's been an intention to, to to probably get a a, a cleaner, more potent strain. Um, and then, you know, but ditch weed it remains still, <laughs> still about one percent, I think. So it's not very popular. So for those heavy users, like the daily users of like an adolescent or early 20s, do you, do you ever recommend residential treatment? I, my understanding is some treatment, residential treatments uh, centers don't see someone that that's, their, that, that that's their drug of choice, accepting those kids into treatment Because their, their rates of, of, of recovery are very poor. So, so how do you approach it then from a standpoint of if someone comes to you and you really think this child, your adolescent is truly addicted to this drug and is greatly affecting their quality of life, then how do you approach that from the standpoint of treatment? Well, I, th I think it would depend um, on do they have a co any comorbid psychiatric illness? Um, chances are they might. Um, those two will intersect at some point. Um, lifetime rates of marijuana use are, you know, 40 percent and Lifetime prevalence of psychiatric disorders is 40 to 50 percent, so they're going to insect, intersect at some point. So it would be important to see if there is something, a, a comorbid psychiatric disorder like ADHD, because ADHD, if it's effectively treated, will lower the risk for continuing marijuana use. Um, so look, I, that's what I do. I look, for, look at that and um, try to work with them on some other forms of abstinence-based kind of a, a, approach. 
um, it so much depends on their how organized and how um, how, how committed their parents are to helping with that. A family systems model is, is oftentimes the best model um, of intervention to use in a traditional outpatient setting. Um, oftentimes, though, if the acting out is sufficient and there's um, other, other drug use going on, then we really do look for a residential setting um, um, for them. So some do still take them. I think that a lot of teenagers who are to that point are probably using other substances too, and so um, their chances of uh, in, in residential treatment are somewhat improved. But I th and I think 20 to 40 percent of them do benefit from residential treatment in terms of if you look at just abstinence from marijuana. So it's worth a shot. I mean, I would do it if it was my kid. You know, I'd try anything. So and many parents are willing to do that. Um, the private, the private um, programs um, will usually take them. So. Well, you all have been a very attentive audience. I appreciate it. If there's any other questions, I'll wait around down here.